Okay, we're in Revelation chapter number 21. and Look, if you would, at uh, verse number 1, which says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now look down at verse number 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The title of the sermon this morning is All Things New. All Things New. And in Revelation 21, we see a new heaven and a new earth. Now, why is it that we see a new heaven and a new earth? Well, the reason for that is because the first heaven and the first earth pass away. Look, if you would, at Second um, Second Peter chapter number 3, just back a few pages there. Second Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 13. Second Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 13. It says, Nevertheless, we... In fact, we'll go back a little bit... Um, I can go back to verse number 10. It says, look, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and then in verse 13, Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now back in Revelation 21 verse 5, it said, Behold, I make all things new. Now there's, there's something about human nature that desires new things. I remember a year or two ago, I, I, I went to a, into a sports shop and I was looking for some running shoes. I remember my old ones, they were kind of worn out and they were ripped and, and so forth. So I went to a place where they have really cheap deals. Um, you know, they had sort of like, they normally have like the old models, they get reduced, you know, sort of cut down prices. And I found some that fit me, and uh, I headed toward the counter, I was going to pay for them. But then Rebecca, who was with me, she said, stop daddy, I want some shoes. And I said, you've already got, look, look what you've got on, you've got lovely shoes, you've already got some nice shoes. But what do you think she said? She said, I want some brand new shoes. I want some brand new shoes. Even as a three-year-old, she already wanted, you know, she had those shoes, but, you know, they were old, and so she wanted some new ones. Now, coveting is not a sin that you actually have to teach a child. You don't have to teach a child to covet. It's one of those things that comes naturally. It's kind of like lying. You don't have to teach your children to lie. They'll lie naturally. You don't have to teach your children to be lazy. Now, not thing I'm down on children saying that they're just coveting, lying, lazy people, but the fact is, that, you know, it's natural, okay? Um, but the thing about it is, though, coveting is a serious sin. It's a serious sin that we do need to fight against. It says in uh, Romans 13, 14, it says, Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So if you want to avoid covetousness, one of the things you should probably do is, is put yourself in situations, avoid being in situations that will cause you to covet. You know, don't spend your time browsing through catalogues, you know, mailers, you know, things brochures that come through and they've got all these shiny items and if you look at them you go oh I could do with one of those oh I could do with one of those okay because um, it's just going to increase your lust it's going to increase your desire for things that you don't need now just a disclaimer I mean sure if you need something hey then you can you know go and look and find out what it is and, and, and search and find what the best deal is etc that's fine but but at the same time we need to be aware of covetousness. We need to be aware of covetousness. Don't, it shouldn't be downplayed. I mean, covetousness is actually, list, is actually listed in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 11. It's listed as a sin that people get thrown out of church for. And we often talk about you know, adultery or fornication or um, you know, a drunkard or things like that. But it says in, um, in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5, it says, But now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Now, just to get, make things clear, don't get the idea that I'm down on new things. That I'm saying you know, desiring new things is necessarily bad. I mean, new things can be good. You know, when God makes a new heaven and a new earth, is that a good thing? Absolutely, that is a good thing. In fact, as Peter wrote, it's something that we should be looking forward to, something we should be desiring. If you're in there in 1 Corinthians Chapter 5, look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 17 describes, it tells us basically God created something new in us when we got saved. You're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a 
new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things are become new. Now this is kind of a, 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 a verse that's maybe um, twisted by people. They'll often they'll take this verse and say, look, can you make me Christ as a new creature? Old things have passed away. And they'll use it to say, you've got to turn from your sins. If, you, if your life's not completely transformed, if, you've not, if you haven't quit all your old sins, then you're not really saved. But, I mean, that's not what it says. It says, look, if any man be Christ, he is a new creature. That's something new that God has created. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. Now, notice it says all. If you're going to say this is talking about your sins, that means you should be sinless. Sinless perfection. And that's, that's the direction some people go down. Okay? But no, this is not what this is saying at all. This is referring to the fact that God created something new in us when we got saved. He gave us a new spirit. You don't need to turn there, but it says in Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Now, you're there in first, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse number 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, this is talking about our bodies. It's saying if, if our body you know, dies. He says, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, there be, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. He's saying, those of us that are still alive, we've still got this, this earthly body. He says, we do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality, that's our mortal body, might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So notice what it's talking about there. It's saying, look, God has given us the earnest of the Spirit. He's actually given us his own Holy Spirit, the earnest, the down payment of that. You're there in uh, 2 Corinthians. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 13. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. This is talking about when people got saved. When someone gets saved, what happens? They trust. They believe, they believe Jesus. When did that happen? After ye heard the word of truth. You know, the Bible says, of his own will begat us with the word of truth. You no know, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. He says, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, there you go, you trusted, you believed, you were saved, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So God gave us the down payment of His Spirit. Look at chapter number 2, verse 1. It says, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Because the Bible teaches that before we are saved, we were dead. Our spirit was dead. He says, We're in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. And the lust of our flesh, notice that, lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So notice, we were dead in sins. Our spirit was dead, but then our spirit was made alive. By God. Look if you look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 19. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 19. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 19. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who is subject to the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So notice, we've received a new Spirit, but we're still waiting for the redemption of our body. We don't have a new body yet. You know, um, we received a new spirit, but we're still waiting to receive a new body. That's why the that's why the Bible describes the battle that's going on inside each believer. Look, if you were to um, uh, back at chapter number seven of Romans, Romans chapter seven, look at verse number eighteen. Romans chapter seven, verse number eighteen. It says, "For I know that in me, this is Apostle Paul speaking, that in me, that is in my flesh, in his flesh and his body, dwelleth no good thing." 
For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. You see, he doesn't, Paul doesn't sort of fit in with that idea of 2 Corinthians 5.17 that all his old sins are gone and, you know, he's sin is perfection. No, he says, look, the, the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. For if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So notice you've got, the, you've got the, the good, but the evil present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, we, you know, there's this battle that's going on. There's a battle that's going on between the, the old man and the new man. And every believer has both. He has the, the, the new man and the old man. Look, if you were to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 22. Ephesians 4.22 says, That ye put off concerning the former conversation, or, or the former you know, conduct, the way you used to behave, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man. So notice, he says, put off the old man, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So he says, look, that's what you're supposed to do. In fact, other places talks about we should put to death. Put to death the old man. The Apostle Paul, he actually said, I die daily. It's not something you do, okay, I've put to death the old man, and now it's all plain sailing. You've got to do it again. You've got to do it again. You've got to do it again. And then he goes and describes, he says, look, this is how you do it. He says, look, wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour. For your members, one of another. He says, look, you want to walk in the new man rather than the old? Well, then stop lying. Stop lying and tell the truth. He says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that you may have to give to him that needeth. He says, look, put off the old man, put on the new man. Don't, don't, don't lie, but tell the truth. He says, look, don't steal, but rather work. Work hard so that you've got so you can give to others. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. He says, look, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Don't, don't have filthiness spewing forth out of your mouth. He says, but rather you should do stuff which is going to edify, it's going to build up others. Why? Because if you do that, he says, look, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, the Holy Spirit dwells inside the believer. So when the believer speaks filthy language, that grieves the Holy Spirit, because he's there. He's there listening to it. Okay? He says, little bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. He brings it up again. Be put away from you with all malice. Beware of evil speaking. Beware of saying, think, think, think is this something that, you know, is this something that Jesus would say? Are these words that he would use? You know? Now, were there times when Jesus used you know, strong language? Yeah, I mean, he, he rebuked the Pharisees. He called them vipers. He called them you know, serpents. And, you know, he, he, he said some things that you might think, hey, that's not necessarily as uplifting as, as, as possible to be. But at the same time, I mean, there are some Christians you'll find today, and they like to use, they like to use rude words because there are words in the Bible that we don't use in any of our conversation. You know, you, reading the Bible, you'll find the word bastard. You'll find the word piss in the Bible. Now, it is used by God. Okay, God uses those words. But that doesn't mean that you can just take any word you want and use it in any context. You know, I mean, should Christians talk about, you know, I'm pissing off this person? Is that, a, is that language that a Christian should use? Yeah, you know, I've heard Christians say that. It's not something we should be using. Okay? It's, it's, we need to use... The words, I mean, the way, the way God uses it, I mean, he particularly uses it. He talks about him that pisseth against the wall. That's what God uses to refer to a man, showing there's a difference between a man and a woman. You know, a man pisseth against the wall, a woman doesn't. Okay? But there's nowhere you find the Bibles. In the Bible, you don't find, you don't find the apostles saying, you know, pee off or whatever. You don't find it. So therefore, that's not something that we should be using. We shouldn't be using words in that context. And it's not a case of, I've heard people say, well, every word of God is pure. It's true, the Bible says that. So therefore you can use every word in the Bible in any context. No, you can't. Guess what? If you hit your thumb with a hammer, and if you say Jesus Christ, those words are pure, but that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. The Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay, there's a place to use God's words, and we need to use the right context to use them. He says, look, 
Put away evil speaking, you know, with all malice. He says, look, instead, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So what we've seen so far, we've seen our old man is corrupt, and new man is righteous. You know, the old is bad, the new is good. I mean, it's the same with the world itself. You know, I mean, look, look at uh, Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 11. Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 11. Genesis 6, verse number 11. It says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Don't you turn We saw back in Romans chapter 8, remember it said, We know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. Okay? But the thing is, God is going to create a new heavens. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. But that doesn't mean, though, that everything new is good and that everything old is bad. That's not what we're saying at all. Look, if you look at Jeremiah chapter number 6. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 16. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 16. Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 16. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So notice what he says here. The old path, it's good. The old path is good. I mean, think about this. What about when it comes to Bibles? What about when it comes to the Bibles? Is the Bible, is the Bible, is this an old book? Or is this a new book? Old what, book. It's an old book. Yeah, absolutely, it's an old book. Okay? So... But then what's the story with all these Bibles that you can get now? If you went to a Christian bookshop, you'd find stacks and stacks of shelves of Bibles... That are new, you know, the, the new King James, you know, the new international version, you know, the, the, the new this, the new that, there's, there's all these new Bibles, okay? They're coming out, I mean, they're coming out every year. You know, there's more new ones coming out, but they're not good, they're bad. Look if you're at 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 17. It says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God on the side of God, speak we in Christ. How do we, know, how do we know that the new Bibles are corrupt and it's not just, well, they're just fixing previous mistakes? Well, because that's what people say. You know, that's why they bring out these new ones, because we're, we're updating, we're fixing the errors in the old ones. But the problem with that is, you see, God promised that he would preserve his word. Look, if you're at Psalm 12, Psalm 12 and verse number 6, Psalm 12 and verse number 6. Psalm 12 and verse number 6. Excuse me. Psalm 12 and verse number 6 says... <clears throat> oh, I'll just get there myself. Psalm 12 and verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God says, look, my words, it's pure... But he says, I will preserve them from this generation forever. That was, that was written by David. That's in the time of David, way before the time of Christ. I'm going to preserve these words forever. Look at Isaiah chapter number 59. Isaiah chapter number 59. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number 21. Isaiah 59 and verse number 21. It says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So God promised to Isaiah, he says, look, he says, my spirit upon, I've put upon you, and my words that I've put in your mouth. He says, they're not going to part out of your mouth, or out of the mouth of your seed, or your seed, seeds, your descendants. And obviously it's not, this is not Isaiah's physical descendants. This is, you know, believers who are going to follow him down through the years. I'm going to look at um, Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah chapter number 30, and verse number 8. Isaiah chapter 30, and verse number 8. Isaiah 30 verse 8 says, Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Notice, it's, it's written down, it's written in a book, and that book is going to be for the time to come forever and ever. Look at Isaiah chapter number 8. Isaiah chapter number 8 and verse number 16. Isaiah chapter number 8 and verse number 16. They say, well, where did God preserve his word? Whereabouts did he preserve it? Isaiah 8, 16 says, Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. 
Notice, it's going to be just like he said with Isaiah. It's the same thing. It's going to be preserved with God's people. You know, Jesus talked about the same thing. He said in, in Matthew chapter number 24, look at Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 35. Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 35. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. His words are not going to be lost. They're not going to be lost. Look at um, Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 17. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 17. Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Jesus said, look, I'm saying, this is the truth, what I'm saying. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Does it sound like we might lose a little bit? We'll lose a few words here and there. Jesus says, no, not one jot or one tittle. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 24. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 24. 1 Peter 1, 24 says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So notice that what we can see here is we can see that things that are new, they can be good and they can be bad. You know, just like you've got the, you know, you've got the old earth compared to the new earth. You know, you've got the old man compared to the new man. But of course, you know, the old can be good when compared to the new. You know, like the old Bible compared to the new Bible. What about this though? What about, what about religion itself? What about religion? You know, which religion is better? You know, the new one? Is, is religion something that's new, or is, something that, or is it something that's old? I mean, here's an example of a, of a new religion. There's a religion called the World Mission Society Church of God. It's described as a new religious movement. It began in South Korea in 1964. So what's that? That's like 50, 54 years ago. Well, that's pretty new. It's pretty new in terms of religions. You know, we've come across them a few times out solving. They claim to have 2.8 million members and more than 8,000 churches worldwide. They've got some pretty bizarre beliefs. They believe in God the Father and God the Mother. They believe that some, some bloke called An Sang Hong is a second coming of Jesus Christ, and that he is the Holy Spirit, even though, well, he actually died in 1985. Okay? They believe that prayer must be done in the name of the Holy Spirit, An Sang Hong. So you know, don't pray to Jesus, you know, whatever you shall ask in my name. No, no, you've got to ask in this other bloke's name, this bloke from South Korea who died. You know, they believe that all human beings were originally created as angels in heaven and that they sinned against God and were sent to the earth as a second chance to return to God. Well, doesn't that kind of sound a bit crazy to think that, you know, that we were all angels? Because the Bible says of saved believers, you know, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that, ye, that we should be called the sons of God. But then the Bible also says, that to which the angel said at any time, thou art my son. You know, he, God didn't call the angels sons. Um, what else did they say? The only way for humans to return to heaven is by keeping the Passover. They've got to keep the Passover with bread and wine, which they believe is Jesus' literal flesh and blood. Okay, I mean, I mean, we sang Psalm 91 before. Maybe they believe that God's, you know, got literal feathers like that. Why not? Okay, um, and they, they've got all these sort of bizarre things, you know. If you to make it to heaven, you've got to follow the teachings of the Bible as taught by An Sang Hong. You know, you've got to follow their interpretation. And the thing is, because he came from a Seventh Day Adventist background, he brought with him a lot of their false teaching. You know about the Sabbath. You know, but interestingly, when they had a church split back in 1978, and uh, there was people who started following a, a, a woman called Um Suin. And she claimed to be our spiritual mother who came down from heaven. And so An Sang Hong, he wrote a book denouncing the false belief, these false beliefs. And, and what, did he, what did he say? He said, women shouldn't be teaching in the church. Well, that's true. That's true. And he actually wrote this as a quote from him. He, because he wrote a book, you know, to contradict what she was saying. And he said, whenever a woman makes assertions in the church, the church will fall under the deception of the devil. Obviously, he was, you know, oblivious to the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs, which he held to, came from someone called Alan G. White, a woman called Alan G. White. Okay, and, and So I, I, he was right onto it, but he wasn't onto it. 
What about some, maybe some older religions? You know, in the 1950s, there was a, a religion um, called Scientology, founded by a guy called L. Ron Hubbard. You know, what about the um, uh, same time you had the, the Unification Church, uh, the, the Moonies, people refer to them, because they were following this guy, uh, Sun Myung Moon. Uh, back in the 30s, there was the Worldwide Church of God, founded by Herbert W. Armstrong. Around about 1900, the Pentecostal movement was kicked off by various people and is often associated with the so-called Azusa Street Revival. Okay, all these different, you know, new religions, this new thing coming along. Back in the 1800s, you had the Jehovah's Witnesses. They got started by Charles Taze Russell. They originally were called the Bible Student Movement, but they, they changed later on their, their name. Um, Christian Science was founded by Mary Baker Eddy. Seventh-day Adventists, we mentioned them before, they were founded by Alan G. White. You know, they actually came from a group called the Millerites. Wonder where the Millerites came from? Well, they were founded by a guy called William Miller. Okay, the Christadelphians come from a guy called John Thomas. Mormonism, they were founded by a guy called Joseph Smith. And you can just go on and on and on. New religion after new religion. You could go back through history and find various sects and cults started by someone or other. And it's always a warning when you say, look back, and they look back to some, this is the person, or even they, they name their group after a particular person, you know? And they always have some new teaching. They always have some, there's some new teaching that they bring in, you know? Well, have a look, if you would, at, at Acts chapter number 17. Look at Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17, because there's, there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible tells us. Look at Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse number 16. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 16. It says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him because he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. What's idolatry? It's, it's false religion. People are, you know, involved with false religion. Verse number 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with them. So what did Paul do? He points out, hey, you're an error. You know, he disputed with them. Look at verse number 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this Babla say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, or you know, unknown to them gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So notice, there's a new doctrine. Okay? Now, was it really a new doctrine? It wasn't really a new doctrine. I mean, look back at verse number um, verse number two. Verse number two of the same chapter, it says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief woman, not a few. So notice, Paul's preaching, but where's he preaching from the Scriptures? Were they new? Or were they old? They were old. Look down at verse number 10. Verse number 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Also of honourable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So notice, we see, he's arguing, he's, arguing, he's, he's proving things out of the scriptures, and because these people, when they look at the scriptures, they realise, hey, what he's saying is right. You know, search the scriptures. You know, Jesus told people to do that. He says, search the scriptures. Um, but now look back if you would, where we were, um, verse number 20. Verse number 20. So what do they say? They say so, tell us about this new thing. What's this new doctrine where you speak? Verse number 20. They say, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. So they're strange things. That means like they've never heard them before. What's that saying? They're just ignorant. They don't know the scriptures. Verse number 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Notice that. It's all about some new thing. And when people say, it's new. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Something new. Yeah, that's, that's what we want to find out about. Verse number 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. So do they know what they're on about? No. Him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing his Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He's saying, look, God is the creator of all. 
God is the creator of all. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He says, look, God is the one who made all of us. Doesn't matter what country you're from. Doesn't matter what nationality. Guess what? He's made us all of one blood. Okay? And then, what does what he say in verse number, um, uh, verse number 27? He says that they should seek the Lord. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. That we should seek him and find him. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own parts have said. For we also are his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we are not to think that the God he is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because he had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, some mocked, some laughed. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So notice, this is what we see. God, he's the one who created the world and he wants people to seek after him and find him and it's revealed in the scriptures. But the Athenians, what they were interested in, they were looking to hear some new thing. They were looking to hear some new thing and it wasn't a good thing. Turn if you to just flick over to Acts chapter number 20. Look at Acts chapter number 20. You see, beware... In some ways, we do need to be aware of new things. Look at Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28. Acts 20, verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So notice, people are coming in. And what are they doing? They're speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Twisted things. They're twisting the scriptures. Okay? And then he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul, he warned people. You know, Peter did the same thing. He said, remember, there's false prophets among the people. There shall be false teachers among you who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them. You know, and it goes on and talks about how they'll make merchandise of you. So he says, look, but what does he say here? And now, brethren, verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So notice what he's saying here. He says, look, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Back in verse 27, he says, I've not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's the protection against the, the new false teaching. The protection against the new false teaching is knowing God's word. Okay, look if you were at Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 23. Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 23. Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 23. It says, the same day came... To him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Notice you've got these Sadducees, they don't believe in a resurrection. So what are they? They're, they're a, a false religious sect. He says they say no re resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall, shall be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. He says, look, you're in error, because you don't know the Scriptures. He says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but... Of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. You see, the problem with these people is they didn't know the scriptures. They didn't know the scriptures. You know, I mean, if people had known the scriptures, when Joseph Smith came along and told them all about Mormonism, would they have been sucked in? No. I mean, remember, you've got, you got, you got the whole, you know, 
that they believe in, it's like celestial marriages, I think they call it, you know, and, and, and it, I mean, multiple wives, it's another thing, if they knew the scripture, know about that. And so if you knew the scripture, it would protect you. You'd realise, hey, this is a pack of nonsense that he's saying. You know, same thing when, when, when you look, he says here in um, uh, verse number 32, he says, look, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're living. Okay, well, that, that doesn't fit in with the whole, what about all these religions that teach soul sleep? You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists. Well, if, if you knew the scripture, you wouldn't be fooled by that. Okay? Um, look at uh, you know, Matthew 22. Look at Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew 24, verse number 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So he says, look, beware that people are going to deceive you, because many people are going to come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, claiming to be Christ. Well, is that what we saw with, you know, the, 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 the World Mission Society Church of God? They claim, people claiming to be Christ. And they're deceiving people because they're ignorant. Why? Because they don't know the Bible. Look at verse number 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Look at verse number 23. It says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise, arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. One of the reasons why they said that he must be the Christ, this, this guy in, in South Korea, they said he fulfilled, he fulfilled these amazing things. But, I, mean, I, I haven't even read to see what they claim he did. But it doesn't matter. He says, look, they're false. Even if they do signs and wonders. He says, Behold, I've told you before, wherefore if they shall say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. If he's in South Korea, don't believe it. If he's in New York in the Watchtower building, don't believe it. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see, the Bible teaches that when Jesus comes back, it's something that people see. You know, look at, look at, um, well, look when Jesus left. Look at Acts chapter number one. When Jesus left, Acts chapter number one in verse number six, Acts chapter number 1, Acts chapter number 1, in verse number 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they're speaking to Jesus. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, while they looked at him, he was taken up. What did he do? He ascended up into heaven. And a cloud received him out of their sight. So he ascended up into a cloud. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So guess what? They saw him go up into the clouds. How's he going to come? He's going to come back in the clouds. You know, back in Matthew chapter number 24, verse 30, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together as elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So he's going to appear in the clouds, just like he left in the clouds. He comes back in the clouds, and what happens? The elect gets gathered. That's the rapture. Okay? That's what's, well, notice, and if we won't bother looking there, but back in, in Matthew 24, that was after the tribulation. Look, if you look at Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. And verse number 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth. Who's blessed? The one who reads. That readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You're blessed if you read. That's going to keep you from falling into error. Look at verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him. So there's going to be something secret. Every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all countries of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Verse number 8, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. You see, Jesus wasn't some new thing. He says, look, I am, he, he says, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. That's Jesus. He's the Almighty. He wasn't a new thing. It says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Jesus didn't come and start his own new religion. He didn't come and start his own new religion. He was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. You know, you can look, you can look at, at, at um, you know, Psalm 22. It talks about Jesus' crucifixion. It talks about them, you know, dividing, casting lots for his garments, you know, piercing his hands and his feet. You know, you can, you can look at Isaiah chapter number 50, 53. You know, it talks about him being brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Okay? Um, right throughout the Bible we can see that Jesus, he was prophesied, he was predicted. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2 says, But thou Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. So where was he going to come from? Bethlehem, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Okay? Um, Isaiah chapter number 7, Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14, Isaiah chapter number 7, Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14, Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Guess what, the virgin conceiving, bearing a son, calling his name Emmanuel, which we read in Matthew means God with us. Look at Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You see, all of these new false religions that we've sort of touched on today, they actually claim to be restoring the old religion. They actually say that they're returning to historic Christianity. I mean, even Islam, Islam makes that same claim. It claims to be new revelation from God. You know, I, I, was, I was talking to someone just last week, and they were saying, yeah, Islam, it's like, it's the updated, it's the updated religion. But it also claims to be the old religion from the beginning. You know, they go back and they say, you know, Abraham was a Muslim. You know, Noah was a Muslim. You know, all the Old Testament prophets, these, these guys are Muslims. That, that's, what they, that's what they claim. But, what it really comes down to is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Look at Isaiah chapter number 8. Isaiah chapter number 8 and verse number 16. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 16. We saw before, remember, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, so seek to someone who's got a familiar spirit. Yes, some spirit came and told me something. Some voice. I had a revelation. That, do you know, that's what Muhammad thought. He actually thought that it was a demon. And guess what? It was right. It was a demon. He says, look, seek not unto them. You know, when they say seek to them that have familiar spirits, unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. All these false religions, they come up and they say things that contradict the Bible. Guess what? It's because there's no light in them. There is no light in them. Look at Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs chapter number 30. And verse number 1. Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 1. The words of Avi, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal. Surely I'm more brutish than any man have not the understanding of a man, I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If that can tell us, talk about God. And, but notice, what is his name and what is his son's name? If that can tell, <coughs> God obviously has a son. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. 
Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So what we've seen, we've been looking at new things, and we've been looking at old things. There are good new things, you know, the new heaven, the new earth, the new creature, the new man. I mean, even the new year. The new year is a good thing. You know, you can, you can look, and look back in Genesis 1, and you see that God is the one who gave us seasons and days and years. God gave us those things. You know, Lamentations tells us his mercies are new every morning. Isn't it great that you can start a new day? It's great that you can start a new year. Okay? But there are also bad new things. There are bad new things. There's new Bibles. You know, there's new religion. There's new revelation from false teachers seeking to lead away disciples after them. Turn, if you would, just last place we'll turn is um, Psalm 119. Just before Proverbs, not the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. And stay there because we're going to sing from here afterwards. Psalm 119. Look at verse number 65. Psalm 119. Verse number 65, it says, look, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good, teach me thy statutes. Notice, it's always, it's back to God's word, back to God's word. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. You see, it's God's law the psalmist delights in. Not some new revelation from some person. Oh, let me tell you some new thing. What's some new doctrine? Let me tell you about this new thing. He says, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. We need to learn God's statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. It's, it's God's word. That's what we should be desiring. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. God's judgments are what's right. And that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let I pray that thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed for they doubt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. Once again, where is he? That's where he's spending his time. That's what he loves. He's thinking about. He's meditating in. Let those that fear thee turn unto me and those that have known thy testimonies. Verse 80. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. We need to be as God's people. We need to be sound in God's statutes so that we won't be ashamed. You want to be not ashamed in the new year? Get into God's word. Read God's word. The whole of God's word. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself um, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, any Bible-believing Christian around the time when you know, some false religion comes up, they should always say, oh, hang on, the Bible says this. Hang on, the Bible says this. Hang on, the Bible says this. We should know God's word. That's the, that's the protection. That's the protection. God's word. It's a new thing. It's an old thing. God's going to do new things. But we need to stick with the old ways. In this new year, make it a new year where you go back to the old ways. Read God's word. Study God's word. Know God's word. Believe God's word. And obey God's word. Do what God says to do. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you, yeah, that, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. That, that you know, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Lord, help us to desire the words of your mouth more than our necessary food. As we start this new year, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to walk in a way that pleases you. Help everything we do, everything we say, help it to be founded upon your word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.